Hey there gang, time for another comic book unboxing. Once again, I have a short box of comic books here that I need to grade for sale on eBay, but as always, I have no idea what has been packed into this box for me to work on. So, we will make that discovery together, and oh my goodness, the good times we will have. <laughs> so, so, if you like comic books, stick around. We're going to have some fun. Hey there, buddy. Welcome to Shanghai. My name is Duke, and this is a comic book unboxing video. As always, I am grading books for sale uh, on eBay. The seller name is Dotcom Comics. This is pretty much my full-time job, grading comic books. Uh, it's about 30 hours of my work week. And uh, we have two websites that uh, we deal on. They are SellMyComicBooks.com and DotcomComics.com. The physical store is Dotcom Comics in Freeport, Maine. But most of our sales are, are one of two sources, either ComicLink.com. So when we buy a collection, comes in the big book, say a Hulk 181 and X-Men 94, uh, those go to CGC, they get slabbed, and those end up sold on a website called comiclink.com. And then the rest of the books, the so-called lesser books, are either sold as what we call raw singles, and those are the books that I'm grading today, or they uh, get parsed into multi-book lots, and those go up on eBay. Pretty much some stuff goes on either of those two websites I mentioned, and of course the retail store, but I would say about... 80-85% of everything that we buy ends up on eBay. So we're going to get a good look at some of the inventory today. Uh, as always, this video isn't really a, a sales pitch. It's not a commercial. Uh, I'm just letting you know where I'm getting these books from, where I'm sourcing them, and what I'm doing with them. The purpose of the video really is just for you and I to geek out over some cool old comic books. So what are we going to see? Well, as I mentioned, we're not going to see any Hulk 181s, I'm pretty sure. Occasionally in one of these boxes, we'll get maybe a low-grade 180 or a 182. Uh, but mostly what we're going to see is books that we would expect to sell on eBay at auction for between 10 and 100 bucks. So that's still quite a wide range of really neat old comic books we're going to get a chance to look at here. And of course, as always, I invite you to leave your comments below. You know, rather you want to respond to something that I say, positive or negative, <laughs> lay into me, that's okay, I can take it. Um, or, you know, if you just want to share your own recollections, reminiscence, uh, nostalgia about these comic books. Or if you want to ask any questions, that's great too. Uh, you know, it's a, this is really intended as a, as a way to sort of foster a dialogue. So, let us then break into the box. I will pull out the first stack, and look what we have right here on the top. That's a good book. First appearance of Killer Frost, Firestorm number three. This is a great series, and it's only a five-issue series, so it's a, it's a good, fun series, an easy series to complete, uh, and as I say, a good, fun series to read. This was canceled because of the DC implosion. I don't know how much you know about the DC implosion. And I should mention right here <laughs> up front, if you haven't seen uh, any of these videos before, I tend to go off on tangents, tell stories. Um, so <laughs> it's not just looking at the books. A lot of it is just listening to me yak. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, I don't know how much you know about the DC implosion, but Late 60s, uh, DC was sold into the uh, corporate American uh, <laughs> morass, <laughs> became part of the Kinney National Corporation, and then eventually part of uh, Time Warner. And then around 1976 or so, a woman named Jeanette Kahn, who had been the publisher of a kids' magazine called Dynamite, she was hired to be the publisher of DC Comics. And, and she brought in a lot of, you know, new and innovative ideas. And, and the line, you know, started to expand, was growing, and uh, kicked off what uh, they were advertising as the DC Explosion. Well, <laughs> come to find out, uh, while she was doing that, the powers that be at Time Warner were, you know, looking into the dusty corners of, of uh, their kingdom, their fiefdom, and uh, cutting things here and there to uh, shore up the bottom line. And the legend is that there was, in the winter of 1977-78, a bunch of blizzards that, that really disrupted 
magazine and comic book distribution. Uh, you know, the legend is that there were books that just sat in warehouses that never even made it to the newsstands. I don't know how true that is. I mean, I was an active comic book buyer then, and I don't remember uh, any any of that. I don't, you know, but again, I live in Maine, so, you know, we have to get, you know, a couple of feet of snow before we're even like, oh, hey, look, it's snowing. <laughs> you know, three feet of snow, and eh, maybe we'll cancel school for the day. Maybe just the afternoon. Maybe we can still fit in half a day. <laughs> so, I don't remember this whole blizzard thing being any kind of a disruption. But the legend is, is so that happened in the winter of 1978, and by the summer of 78, just as the explosion was kicking off and all the new titles were coming out and the books were expanding, somebody at Time Warner looked at all the books DC was publishing, and there were only about 40 books at that time. I mean, they published fewer books in a month than, than these days they publish in a week. <laughs> As I've told you, you know, DC, Marvel, both, the entire industry is just glutted. You know, they just publish way too many books at uh, at present. But anyway, at that time, there were about 40 books in the line, and somebody drew a line right in the middle of the sales chart, and it was determined everything below that would be canceled. Well, Firestorm was one of the books that didn't make the cut. I kind of wish it had. And it would come back a few years later as Fury of Firestorm and have a nice long 100-issue run. Uh, but, uh, you know, if only, you know, it, if this had had a chance to find an audience, because again, when the, when the hammer came down, only maybe the first couple of issues were out. They really probably didn't have any, much of any sales information to go on because back then it took three or four months to get your sales information back from the newsstands. So anyway, it's unfortunate this book was canceled. It was a great, great series, a great new character. And, uh, yeah, if you can get together those uh, five issues of that run, I think you'll be very happy with that. I think you'll be happy with this. So that's that story. <laughs> let's, let's press on, shall we? Uh, and sometimes, sometimes uh, I have to break these videos in two because I will get too chatty. I'll get diarrhea over the mouth and uh, the video will run too long. And so it, it may come to pass that I will cut this video in half and we'll have to pick up where we left off tomorrow uh, and I won't know really until the end so what will happen is <laughs> we'll get to just a certain point and the video will just stop there might be a little clip of me saying eh that's it come back tomorrow I, I do want to say too if I haven't said like share subscribe comment do all the groovy things please do do that also um, it's a little hot today up here in the Sanctum Sanctorum uh, 88 degrees is hot as a uh, hooch's cooch here in Maine and so I have a fan running. I'm hoping that won't be creating too much background noise for the video. But if it is, let me know and I'll try and come up with some other solution. So anyway, uh, Daredevil 49. And it looks like we've got two of those. Daredevil number 50. Captain Marvel 15. What Zoe? Oh, that Zoe might live. Captain Marvel number 16. Moving backwards, number two, number thirteen, and I don't, I don't get that this series was particularly exciting <laughs> at the time. I don't think it sold all that well. Uh, this, uh, this sold uh, marginally better. What is this? What is this little tag stuck here? I don't know. Some little orange tag for no particular reason. Um, I have seen online that this particular cover won uh, some kind of a fan award. Uh, I can't remember what the award was named, but there were these fan awards that, that ran for several years in the late 60s, early 70s, and this was deemed the best cover of the year. Now, you don't often see this advertised as a classic cover or an iconic cover, but it was indeed voted the best cover of the year for, I think it was 68. Oh, wow, look at this. Okay, so... <laughs> It's, it's another thing I have to get used to. I tend to, uh, I have these little um, exclamations uh, <laughs> when I see something that I don't see very often. Because a lot of stuff, like these Captain Marvels, these Daredevils, I see them over and over and over again. It's hard to keep up the enthusiasm um, for you, uh, the viewer. But things like this are cool. So this is uh, the uh, Blue Beetle. And Blue Beetle bounced around from a bunch of different publishers. May even have fallen into the public domain, but that, you know... People kept using him, swiping him, basically. Uh, <laughs> and this is the original version. Uh, Dan Garrett 
that was published by, this is Charlton Comics, and it would be shortly after this that uh, Steve Ditko would revitalize the character, create the new Ted Cord version, but again, this is the original version that they published for a short time before coming up with a Blue Beetle that you probably recognize today. And this particular Blue Beetle, he tended to have um, these scarab-induced magic powers, and it was kind of like whatever the plot called for, he would have that power. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but look at this, the Praying Mantis Man. Now there's a there's a, a cool uh, a cool villain. This is a cool book. This is another one that was killed by the DC implosion. This one lasted a little longer. This one lasted 11 issues. So DC probably did have some good sales data to work on when, uh, when the line was drawn. And this one was not above the line, but this was a fantastic uh, series when it first came out. The Black Lightning that you may know from the CW series, you know, with the wife and kids, much different than the original Black Lightning, what I think of as my Black Lightning. Because there was some point in the, I don't know, if the 90s, the 2000s, somewhere where they did a reboot, and he just all of a sudden had kids he never had before, and they were like teenagers. And from that point on, it was no longer, you know, my Black Lightning. But this original Black Lightning by Tony Isabella, art by Trevor Von Eden. Uh, which, by the way, Trevor Von Eden, I never knew this as a kid, but he's a, a black artist in so much as that makes any difference to you. I know these days, identity politics, you know, everyone really cares about, you know, what color <laughs> the artist is, you know, or what gender or preference. Uh, Trevor Von Eden then uh, was black, if that matters to you. But like I said, it didn't matter to me as a kid. I just knew this name, Trevor Von Eden, produces great art. I'm buying that book. Uh, but the original Black Lightning series was kind of a cross between Breaking Bad and a welcome back, Cotter. It, <laughs> it was like breaking Cotter. And that's what I'd like to see in like a Black Lightning movie. Like set in you know that, that kind of uh, elevator pitch, you know, breaking Cotter, set in the 1970s. And you know, the crime-ridden New York streets of the 70s before, uh, before Mayor Rudy came to town and cleaned things up. But uh, yeah, this, this was a great series. Only lasted 11 issues, again... Killed by the DC implosion. Uh, and as a kid, I think number four was my first issue. So I, I didn't have this first issue as a kid. Here's some Silver Age World's Finest comics. World's Finest never sells that well for us. Um, you know, it will usually go for, you know, half again. Uh, or, or not half again, because that would be price plus a half. So just half. <laughs> you know, your typical Superman or Batman book of this era, a world's finest book, will bring about half what you might expect from either of those main titles. Even though, uh, you know, some of them are pretty good. A lot of the world's finest stories, they're pretty much just knockoffs. You know, kind of hacking it out. This is cool. <laughs> That's a good box. <laughs> if I get more than three This Is Cools out of a box, it's a good box. So Red Circle, you may or may not know, uh, that is an imprint of Archie Comics. So around this time, this would be the uh, mid-70s, it says Fawcett, but Fawcett was just the distributor. Fawcett was long out of publishing comic books at this point. So they were just the distributor back then of the Archie books. But Red Circle was an imprint of Archie Comics, uh, their superhero line and their mystery horror line. So Red Circle Sorcery, number six. And the thing I like about this title, and, and I think it might even be the cover artist here, and yes it is because I see a signature kind of hidden here in the bookcase, Gray Morrow, who was a, an underrated artist. He, uh, he did a lot of the work in this sorcery book. Here's another issue, Chilling Adventures in Sorcery. So this is number five. Maybe I'll give you, whoops, that, that fan just took the cover out of my hands, but here's some of what Grey Morrow looked like inside. He drew um, very sexy women, but not like cheesecake sexy. 
you know. And so anyway, there you go. It's the last issue of uh, the original Silver Surfer title. Amazing Spider-Man 110 fighting the Gibbon. 163 against Kingpin. And let's pull out another stack. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'll just pull this out now because uh, I can see here the uh, the top of the, the next stack. Look at that. That's what made me go, oh, wow. National Comics. That's a Golden Age book. That's quality comics. This is after all the superheroes have departed. And what we had was uh, the lead feature was this kind of comedy adventure thing, the Barker. So a Barker, if you don't know, if you haven't been to a, a carnival or a county fair, they don't really have Barkers anymore. Well, maybe to a, a certain extent, you know, the game booths. But the Barker was the person who stood outside the tent. Rather, it was a freak show or games of chance or whatever. And was basically barking at the people walking by, trying to entice them to come in and spend their money. And so he had his... Uh, his circus pals, I think that was the strong man, the fat lady, the, the dwarf, uh, or little person. I'm not sure what the correct uh, verbiage is today. And I know if we open this up, number 65, there might actually be a little bit of superhero still. We might have some Quicksilver in here. Let's take a look. Uh, let's see. Sally O'Neill. So that was a... A lady cop feature. There's Quicksilver. Boom. So Quicksilver is, uh, if you're familiar with DC Comics, Impulse. Uh, Quicksilver is the character because, you know, he went into limbo for a long time. And then by the time he was used again uh, at DC Comics, Marvel had already jumped to the name. They had their own Quicksilver. And so the character became known as Max Mercury. But that's, uh, that's who that is. He was a speedster. What else have we got in here? Steve Wood, don't know who he is. Kind of a detective. Lassie, not the dog, but a comedy strip. What else have we got here? Anthrop. No idea what the hell Anthrop is all about. Uh, <laughs> Granny Gumshoe. So, <laughs> old lady detective. And uh, here we have... The Barker and all of his circus freak pals. And there he is, barking away. All right, that's fun. That's fun. It's not easy to do this with this fan going here. I may have to turn this off. Journey into Mystery, 124, 123. Here's a, unfortunately, it's got some heavy damage up here, but that's Justice League of America number 18. Big Adam, that's a trope. You'll see that now and again. Giant size Adam. Another Justice League. That's uh, one of the early JLA JSA team ups. Iron Man number 13, number 16. Here again, uh, the Archie Adventure series, but they weren't calling it uh, Red Circle at this point. This is a little earlier in the Silver Age. It's kind of a low grade, but. Archie did kind of a superhero version of the Shadow. You know who the Shadow is, the the pulp character. And here he's looking kind of pulpish. This might even be the first issue, I'm not sure. But they would try and make him over into, well, here you go. They made him a superhero. <laughs> Which is kind of the last thing you would consider doing with the Shadow. Uh, and this really didn't last that long. But that's just kind of one of those you got to have it in your collection. It's just so weird in Oddball that you need to have that. And here he is again, looking actually very Jack Kirby-ish. as both, both costume design and the artwork. Here's another one. Good nice little run here. We might have the whole, the whole thing. I wonder if, because I don't think it went much more than five issues... We might be able to score a premium by selling this as a set rather than five individual singles. What do you think? What would you do? Would you sell that uh, Shadow 1 through 5 as a set or as singles? What do you think would do better? Well, what do you think of this? So I've told you this story before. Super Comics, uh, that was uh, the brainchild of a fellow named 
Israel Waldman, I believe was his name, a fellow who bought a bought or acquired a printing press somehow, and, and along with it came all the plates from older comic books. And so he seemed to think that because he had these plates, possession is nine-tenths of the law, he could reprint those books. Well, I mean, really he couldn't, but he did. <laughs> and the numbering's all over the place. Like these, you know, Strange Planets, 15, I don't know, I'll have to look it up, but that could be the, actually the first issue. He was notorious for starting at like 15, 18, or whatever. None of the series really lasted that long. Three, four issues, you know, five at the most. Because, again, he was just using up the plates that he had. But they're all books, you know, they're reprints of earlier books, largely from small publishers. Some of it was from um, early Timely slash Marvel books. But I would have to look up, uh, again, on comics.org or someplace, what exactly is in this issue and where it's from. There were a handful of uh, books that were original. That, you know, whatever happened with the original printer, the plates were made, but the book was never actually published. You know, maybe they couldn't pay their bill or whatever. Uh, and so even though the plates were on hand, the book had never been printed. And so as it turned out, although he probably had no idea, <laughs> um, the book that uh, Waldman ran off was, in fact, the first printing, the first appearance, because the book had never been printed. All right. Uh, showcase, the DC Comics uh, kind of spotlight issue, Tommy Tomorrow of the Planeteers, who well, this time I believe had a backup feature in Action Comics. So they were trying him out to see if it was worth breaking him into his own series. Apparently it wasn't. Detective Comics, uh, fighting a big old Moby Dick. It's kind of interesting. Uh, he would reach into his belt and get his um, bat whale repellent. <laughs> like the Batman movie, the shark repellent. This is uh, the Shazam series that uh, probably would have been canceled earlier because it really didn't take off. But then uh, there was a Shazam TV show, Shazam, uh, and then in the second season, Isis. Uh, and so the book lasted because there was a TV show, a little longer than it maybe otherwise would have. And so, uh, I don't know, back when uh, the DC uh, Universe app still had the video stuff, you, uh, you could watch that whole series with the, on there. I don't know if it made the transition over to HBO Max. I don't think it did. Here's some Silver Age Fantastic Four, number 71. Here's a nice book. Spider-Woman, number one. That's probably about a, well, you got a fold here, so it's probably a six-ish, maybe. Maybe a five-five. But that'll still be like a $40 book anyway, I bet. Here's the first issue of that series. This book kind of languished uh, because it sold high. Speculation, because, you know, in the 40s and 50s, Captain Marvel, Shazam, actually outsold Superman. And when Fawcett finally threw in the towel, partly because of a copyright infringement suit uh, that uh, DC had waged for, uh, for years and years. And I think it was spacious. I don't think that... Captain Marvel was similar enough to Superman that it warranted a copyright infringement suit. But that's what they tried, to try and crush it. It eventually succeeded, partly that and partly just the downturn in the market, and Fawcett bailed. So when this book came out, uh, especially with the original artist, C.C. Beck, there's his signature. Well, it's just block lettering, but um, there was a lot. And, of course, the other thing is this sort of coincided with the rise of the fan back issue market which was kind of a new phenomenon at that time. Uh, and so uh, speculation was high on this book. It sold a shit ton. And then because there were so many copies in the back issue market and the book ended up not being that popular, this thing languished for years as like a two, three, four dollar book. But lately it's taken off. And even with all these spine ticks, I would still expect this to go for 20, 25 bucks. Weird Mystery Tales, that's a uh, mid-70s or early 70s DC book. I don't think this one lasted all that long, 15 or 20 issues. First issue of the uh, first volume of Secret Origins. Well, first it was a, a Secret Origins one-shot, 
Then there was this series, and it was a reprint series, reprinting the uh, first appearance and origins of a lot of uh, DC heroes. And then, of course, in the 80s, it came back as a, uh, as a I ran about 50 issues and all new, all new um, stories. Strange suspense stories from Charlton. And this has uh, definitely got some Ditko art in it, I would presume. Ms. Marvel number 18, special guest star issue. Looks like we got some Avengers action happening. We've got an unfortunate fold, that whole length right there, though. All right, well, I think that uh, we will cut things off right here in order to keep this video at a manageable length. Uh, YouTube doesn't really like videos that run on too long. About 20, 25 minutes seems to be about as much as most people can take. Let me know in the, in the comments below. Are you comfortable with these unboxing and grading videos if they run 30, 40 minutes an hour? Let me know, or do you prefer them cut into smaller bite-sized chunks, as I am about to do? We're going to stop here, and then we'll pick up tomorrow with the back half of this box. So please do come back then. And until then, goodbye, good luck, and please be good to each other.